Thanks for joining us here today at Victory Church, where we invite people to belong before they believe. If you want to know more about who we are and what we do, or if any of our messages have impacted your life and you would like to partner with us in giving to this ministry, we invite you to do so by visiting our website at victory.church. Now, let's check out this week's message from our lead pastor, John Chesty. Hey, Victory Church, welcome to, welcome to church today. Are you excited to be in the house? Hey, uh, I wanna take a second before I start and greet the Edmond campus, but really I wanna greet the most special person in the universe to me is uh, Michelle, and my kiddos are at the Edmond campus today. So I love you, I love you guys so much. That was awkward for everyone else, but I don't care. Uh, I love you. So um, there, it's over, okay? Now I can get back, get back to, to normal. Uh, so glad you're here, so excited to, to bring a word to you today. Before I do, uh, something's coming up that I wanna kind of give you, unpack some weeks coming up that are very important uh, in our church. So every year, if you're new to Victory Church, every year we do something called Heart for the House, and that's coming up. If you don't know what that is, really every year, usually in the spring, this year we delayed it to the fall, we kind of do a vision casting series where we talk about our church and who we are and what we do. And then we, we kind of finish that by taking up what we call a heart for the house offering, which really is just us having an opportunity to say, you know what, this is my house and I have a heart for this house and I wanna sow a seed into what I believe is fertile soil for the kingdom of God and also believe in that God's gonna do something in me. So that's coming up. So uh, two weeks from today, we will start a series called Heart for the House. And for three weeks, I will preach uh, kind of vision casting messages about who we are, this is what we do and some vision for the church in the future. And then we will finish on November the 6th. We'll finish that series on November the 6th. And on November the 6th, we will take up the Heart for the House offering. The reason I say that is that we've had a lot of people coming to us saying, hey, when's the Heart for the House offering? I've been praying and setting aside some money that I wanna sow into the church. And so that's when that's gonna be, November the 6th. And this is, this, is, this is what we call an opportunity, not an obligation, okay? This is not paying your dues to be a part of this church, nothing of the sort. What we're saying in this season uh, is we have a heart for this house and we wanna sow a seed into this house. So it's opportunity, not obligation. We're just saying, ask the Holy Spirit uh, if you should give and what you should give and, and just be led by the Holy Spirit in, in, in that season of your life, all right? So that's coming up very quickly, November the 6th, all right? So uh, turn in your Bibles with me to Habakkuk, okay? Habakkuk, what a fun word. Let's say that word, say Habakkuk. Uh, if you don't know where Habakkuk is, it's towards the, more towards the end of the Old Testament. So if you get to Matthew, you've gone too far. Um, so, so go to the book of Habakkuk. And if you're, um, you're you know, worn out by trying, you can go to version or just follow along on the screens, okay? Uh, I wanna bring a word to you today that uh, is maybe one of the most bizarre um, aspects or elements of being a Christ follower. This, this season we've been in is called Uncommon Kingdom. And over and over again, we've talked about that there are two kingdoms at play. There's the, the kingdom of this world that we live in, and there's the kingdom of heaven. So we live in the world, but we're not of the world. We have an uncommon kingdom. And today I wanna to talk about an element of the uncommon kingdom that in my opinion is one of the most bizarre, I would call it bizarre, but also almost kind of magical in a sense that, that we as believers have the ability to do something that I think is pretty powerful. So the context of this passage that I'm gonna read, uh, Habakkuk, in Habakkuk 1, the prophet Habakkuk is, is kind of praying and pouring out his heart to God. And I'm paraphrasing these first couple of chapters. He, in, 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 in one sense, he's asking God to bring justice on the nation of Israel because of the sins of Israel. He said, how long will you sit aside and let this happen? And then in, in chapter two, God kind of comes and surprises him and says, okay, I'm gonna do this but I'm gonna use Babylon to do it. And I'm actually gonna crush Israel and I'm gonna exile everyone to Babylonian exile. And it's almost like Habakkuk's like, ooh, okay, I didn't quite mean that, you know? And he, he's, he's struggling in a sense because God is gonna use a nation that's even more evil to, to bring justice upon the nation of Israel. And so Habakkuk is wrestling with this in the first couple of chapters. And even into the beginnings of chapter three, he's realizing what's happening. 
And really what, what is he seeing, what he's seeing come, come to play is really a worst case scenario. He's seeing something happen that is gonna be really bad. And then I wanna pick up uh, his response. So in verse 17, I'm gonna kind of read to you the magnitude of what's happening in this story. And then we're gonna learn from his uncommon response because he sees a different kingdom at play. So verse 17 says this, this, it says, though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no fruit, though there is no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls. Now watch his response in verse 18. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. And what he's describing is this worst case scenario. And I wanna kind of lay the groundwork here to let you know that when he's listing these things, the olives and the grapes and the, and the, and the figs and the cattle and the sheep, he's not just saying what's happening because in the nation of Israel, everything is symbolic. So all of the things that he's listing are, are not just practical, but they're also symbolic. So when he mentions figs and grapes, in, in, in the scriptures, figs and grapes are, are kind of symbolic of prosperity and wellness. So what he's saying is the nation of Israel is being stripped of all of our prosperity. And then, and then he mentions olives, and olives represent peace to the nation of Israel. I'm gonna extend an olive branch. You've heard this phrase. It means I'm, I wanna make peace with you. So he's saying that all of your prosperity is gonna be gone, all your peace is going to be gone. All of your, and, and, then, he, and then he says, and your fields will not produce. So he's saying, not only am I gonna take away everything that the fields has already produced, I'm gonna take away the field's ability to produce more. So this would be like you saying, not only did, did my bank account get wiped out, the job I had that fed my bank account got wiped out too. So everything has been wiped out. The fields have been wiped out, which was, which, which was symbolic of their provision and their survival. And then it goes on to say that the sheep pens are empty. There's no sheep. Well, sheep kind of represented gentleness and, and innocence and purity. So all of your innocence, all of your purity, all of your gentleness is going to be stripped away, Israel. And then he, he mentions cattle and, and cattle was used for sacrifice and food. So I want you to, I'm just trying to lay the groundwork for how devastating this was and how this truly was a worst case scenario. And it was impa impacting every area of their life. It was in, impacting their body, their spirit, and their mind. It was a spiritual blow, it was a mental blow, and it was a physical blow because they were about to starve. It, it impacted every single area of their life and his response is what's inspiring to me. It's one of the most uncommon responses that you will ever see in the kingdom of God that really separates us from the world that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we have an ability to rise above circumstances and to respond with something that the common person could never truly respond with. So what I wanna talk about today, and it's the title of my message, is worst case worship. Worst case worship. Let's pray and we'll dive into this today. Lord, we thank you for your word. I pray that you would um, even transcend my ability to communicate this, that you would give me words that may not be in my notes, that you would use this, this word to encourage us, to inspire us, to challenge us. So um, we lean into this today, Lord, with an open mind, with an open heart, Teach us, God, the art of worst case worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I've been to several sporting events, as, as likely you have too, and the common response at a sporting event is when something goes your way, you cheer. And when something doesn't go your way, you boo. This is supernatural, right? Like, not supernatural, it's super natural. Get it? Okay. So, it's common. It's how we respond. Okay, so let's, let's, let's paint a scenario. Let's just pretend that OU gets stomped by TCU, okay? <laughs> We're just gonna pretend for just a second. I don't know why you're laughing. We're just doing the hypothetical here, okay? I don't know, what, I don't know. Let's pretend that you are at TCU and you're wearing an OU jersey, an OU shirt, and TCU scores a touchdown, and you jump out of your seat, and you're like, yeah! That's crazy, right? You would never do that. You would never respond with joy when your team is losing or when there's a worst-case scenario happening. 
But for some, some reason, Habakkuk responded in this crazy way that doesn't even make sense, but yet something supernatural is happening in his life. And he, he paints this picture and he shows this and we see this happening. I've seen this as a pastor many times. Uh, as a pastor, a lot of times you go to the hospital and sometimes you're going to the hospital when you know someone's gonna recover and sometimes you're going to the hospital when you know they're not going to recover. And the family has been called in and everyone knows that we're gonna circle around their bed and they're just gonna die. They're in hospice and we know it's just a matter of time, a few hours. And as a pastor, you walk into the room and you can instantly know what's happening. You can instantly tell the vibe of the room if it's, if it's low or if it's worshipful. And I've walked into both. I've walked into ones where people are surrounding the bed of the person that's, that's passing from, from this, this, this earth into a heavenly kingdom and people are not sad, they're actually joyful. There's actually a rejoicing of singing hymns and worshiping God while something that's very near and dear to them is going away. And you're, I know you're probably picturing someone in their 80s or 90s happening, but I've been in both. I've been in rooms where the people that shouldn't be dying are dying, but still there's a rejoicefulness to it. There's still joy in the room that's supernatural, that's, that's really unexplainable. Uh, we have uh, a, a person in our church, in fact, and I didn't talk to them before, so I don't want to use their name, but somebody in our church that attends the Oklahoma City campus that uh, in, in, in the course of the very recent past, in the past month or two, had a devastating tragedy in their family, and his spouse died unexpectedly and very, very suddenly. And our church rallied around them and loved them and, 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 and have helped them process through this very devastating and, and uh, horrifying thing. But something really powerful happened when just a week or so later, we had a worship night here at this campus and this particular person serves on our new prophetic ministry team. And I look across the room and I see this person who's literally just went through a worst case scenario, who's prophesying over other people and encouraging other people and lifting his hands in worship and adoration in an absolute worst case scenario. This is uncommon, but it's something that we have access to as believers, that we have this supernatural power by the power of the Holy Spirit to not allow the things of this world to impact my feelings, but I can rise above my feelings and find something else to rejoice in. And this is what I wanna talk about today. I wanna talk about this worst case worship and how we can all tap into this thing. And so today I'm just gonna give you three things, okay? Three things that help us do one of the most uncommon things uh, in this world when we rise above our circumstances and can worship and praise God anyways, all right? You with me? Oh, are you with me? Yeah. All right, here we go. So let's go back. It says the grapes are gone, the figs are gone, the olives are gone, the fields are barren, the cattle is go are gone, and the sheep are gone. And then it transitions into this really crazy phrase, that has one word in it that is probably, in my opinion, the most powerful word in this whole passage. It says, yet. Look at your neighbor and say, yet. Yes. Yet will I rejoice in the Lord. Here's the worst thing that could ever happen to us, but we're gonna rejoice anyways. So point number one, if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. If we're gonna become worst case worshipers, we have to find our yet. We have to find our yet, our ability to rise above the circumstances. So worse, it's, Habakkuk is basically saying it's a worst case scenario, but still, but still. You can almost kind of see this, I've pre-decided. I've predetermined. Before the worst case scenario ever hit Habakkuk in the face, he already knew the goodness of the Lord was so good that he had pre-decided that when the worst case scenario came, he rose above the worst case scenario and worshiped anyways. So you see this all through scripture. It declares that God is more impactful to me than the world is impactful to me. And it's all through scripture. Let me just show you a couple of them, okay? So one, you'll, you'll know all of these most likely, but one that's very common to you that you would pick if you were preaching is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay, so Daniel, let's look at this one. Daniel chapter three, verse 16. It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this manner. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, that's worst case scenario, in case you wouldn't paying attention. That's kind of bad, all right? 
The God we serve is able to deliver us from it and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. Watch verse 18, they had predecided. But even if he does not, we have predetermined, we have predecided that we, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. It was an even if, right? It was a yet kind of faith. They had found their yet. Job, uh, Job had found his yet too. He doubted for a long time. He questioned for a long time. But in Job, he finally ends up, says, he ends up saying, he's talking, to God, talking about God, and he says, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Though he slay me, Job found his yet and said, it doesn't matter, I'm still gonna trust him. Uh, David uh, found his yet in Psalm 42, 11. It says, he's, he's talking to himself, okay? If you talk to yourself, you're in good company because David talked to himself. He's like, why my soul are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, here it comes, for I will yet praise him. He's saying, I don't care how I feel, I'm going to apply my yet and praise him anyway. You see this all through scripture. Let me show you one more, Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas had a yet kind of praise. They had been thrown in prison, worst case scenario, beaten, imprisoned, shackled, chained in the inner cell. Acts chapter 16, verse 25, it says about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing, singing hymns, which is such a common thing for prisoners to do. You know, I mean, that's, isn't that what you would do? <laughs> I'd probably be in a fetal position crying. <laughs> Silas would be consoling me. It's okay, John, you know. Singing hymns and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. I want you to catch the yet here, okay? Their yet broke the yoke. Did you catch that? They, their worship, their ability to find their yet broke stuff off of them. Pastor Wade preached a message on this several months ago, and he, he, one of his points in his message was that your praise can actually break someone else's chains. And I don't know if you saw this in this passage, but it says that only Paul and Silas were worshiping. They were the only ones worshiping. They were the only ones praising. They were the only ones singing. And the verse says, and everyone else heard them. But then when it came time for the chains to break, it says that everyone's chains broke. Not just Paul and Silas's broke. And so when we, when we have the ability, it's not just about us. It's about our kids watching us worship in a worst case scenario. It's about our friends, our coworkers, our spouse watching us find a place to have joy and rejoice and worship God in a place where it shouldn't be that it can actually impact others. When you walk into a room and you see somebody passionately worshiping, it's contagious. Worship is contagious. And, and this is what happened in, in my life. So whenever I first kind of had my experience with the Lord, I grew up a preacher's kid, okay? And everyone's like, I knew there's something wrong with you, John. That's what I figured it was. I was a preacher's kid and I grew up in a very expressive church. Let's just put it that way. My dad was a Pentecostal holiness preacher, okay? So... I've seen it all. Let's just leave it at that. I can tell some stories, but I've seen it all. I grew up, um, I have a real heart for preacher's kids, a real heart for preacher's kids, because I was one. It's really hard to be a preacher's kid. It's really hard to be a preacher's kid because everyone has expectations of you. And I found it very hard to, to, to worship. I, I went my whole childhood into my teenage years without really ever expressing worship. Uh, even into my early college years without ever really expressing worship because I had this, this thing like, well, if I, if I do it, everyone's gonna think that I'm just doing it because I'm, I'm the preacher's kid or they're gonna think I'm faking. And, and none of these things were true, but they're the things that were rolling through my head. And so it was something that I never could really express myself in worship. I get into college and then I become this college captain, college basketball, and now I'm the cool guy. Well, I can't worship for sure because I'm the cool guy, you know? So I had this radical encounter with the Lord. I can't tell you what the sermon was. I can't tell you what, what the worship was. Usually I sit on the back row of chapel and, and do things I shouldn't be doing. And that day I left and I came down to the altar and I wept and I cried like a baby and God radically changed my life. And so I, I always tell people, Michelle and the Holy Spirit changed my life. Because Michelle was like, well, if you want this, 
you're gonna have to get to know him, okay? That's, that's, I was like, okay, then sign me up, God. What do I gotta do, you know? <laughs> so after I've had this, had this encounter, I didn't even talk to Michelle about this before I preached this today. There was this special service that's like revival or like a worship night that they were gonna have like a week after I'd had this encounter. And so I go to this and I'm like on fire, but I've really still yet to really express it. And remember, I'm the cool guy. I can't, I can't do this. We're, we're standing in the front and something happens in Michelle. Now you gotta know Michelle. If you don't know Michelle, Michelle is the most extreme introvert, right? She's not expressive at all. She, she's quiet, okay? This girl started dancing. This, you guys don't understand. Like if you understood what I just said, you would be like in the floor right now. Something supernatural happened in her and she starts dancing in the front row and her dance, I want you to, I want you to catch this. Her worship broke my chains. Her expression of worship gave me permission to not care what anyone thought anymore. And we started, I woke up the next day and my calves were sore. That's how much we danced. Like I was sore the next morning. And from that moment on, I couldn't wait to get into a church service and just in worship, hands up. I finally got to the point where I didn't care. Michelle accepts me, Michelle loves me. The way I am, God loves me the way I am. I don't care what anybody else thinks. I'm gonna worship him the way that God designed me to worship and express the worship. I found my yet. That's what happened. I found my yet. So we have to get past these things. Even when, even if, God hasn't answered my prayer yet, yet will I praise him. God hasn't healed me yet, but still, I still got a reason to praise him. God hasn't came through in the way that I thought he would come through. That's okay. I can still find a reason to give him my praise and my adoration. And our yet makes us better, y'all. Our yet makes us better. And this is applicable to lots of areas of your life if you find your yet. Okay, it's, 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 it's applicable to your body, to your mind, to your soul, to your spirit man, all of these things is applicable. Let me give you an example. I really want a cheeseburger, yet I'm gonna order a salad. You know, like, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, find your yet, predetermine, predecide. I'm gonna praise the Lord no matter what life throws at me, okay? So that's the first step, we're gonna find our yet. Let's go back to verse 18. Verse 18 says, yet I will rejoice, really important word, in, say in, in, in the Lord. And then it says this, I will be joyful in, say in in God, my Savior. Point number two, if you're taking notes. First, you gotta find your yet. Second, you gotta find your in. You notice he didn't say, I rejoiced in my circumstance. I rejoiced in my suffering. I rejoiced in losing everything we had. No, because that's silly. If you really wanna find the ability to establishing a worst case worship, you have to really discover what your hope is in. In is the key. I'm rejoicing in God, not in my circumstances. I'm finding the right thing to focus on. So I don't know about you, but I'm really like I'm an expert at rejoicing in victories. I'm really good at this. Haven't you ever somebody say, when something happens their way, thank Jesus, thank you Jesus. That's not hard. It's not hard to worship God when, when the check shows up in the mailbox. It's not hard to worship God when your spouse starts behaving the way you want them to behave, amen? I have to find the ability to rejoice and to worship and to praise in something other than, than what my circumstances are. We see this kind of playing out in real time with Habakkuk. Habakkuk had every single reason not to praise, yet. Yet. So then you'll notice something really powerful that he says. It's grammatical. He says, I will rejoice. Notice he didn't say, I did rejoice, or I had rejoiced, or I am rejoicing. He is faced with the, the, the magnitude of the situation. He's been presented with a worst case scenario. 
And he's saying, I have predetermined and predecided that I'm gonna. It's future tense. We catch him right in the middle of this decision. He's right in the middle of this decision where he's saying, man, this is terrible. This is worst case scenario. But I'm choosing and I'm making the decision that in just a second, I'm gonna come out of my situation and I'm gonna go into worship. I'm gonna go into praising. He's having this moment where he's realizing that he has something else to worship. He's convincing himself in the moment that he's still got a reason to praise. We always have a reason to praise. We always have a reason. And most of the time we don't worship because we're waiting on a reason to do so. Um, I, I, I sense this sometimes in, in church. I talked about this um, earlier in the service where we, we, we come into church and we're so downcast by the things of this world and the weak and our boss and our circumstance and our mortgage and our kids and everything that we get into church and it takes us a while to warm up because we're just trying to find a reason, a feeling, an unction. God, make me feel like worshiping. And God's like, no, the, we have the ability as believers in this uncommon kingdom that we can actually rejoice in worst case scenarios. So he's having this, 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 this experience. He's saying, I don't rejoice in the answer, I rejoice in the one who gives the answers. I don't rejoice in my provision, I rejoice in the provider. Because we have to know what we're finding our, our joy, our peace, our, 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 our praise, our worship, what are we finding it in? So you have to find your yet and you have to find your end. Let me show you this passage in Psalm 100 verse one. It says, make a joyful shout to the Lord all you lands, serve the Lord with gladness, come before him, uh, his presence with singing. It's an invitation. He's saying, come in, come, come in. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not, uh, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. He's saying, you gotta find your in. And this verse is saying, let me show you your in. Hebrews, uh, the book of Hebrews talks about that we can, because Jesus is our high priest, we can now boldly enter into the throne of grace. That's your end. That's where you can find a reason to praise him. Because your time on this earth is about this long compared to all of eternity that would wrap around this building for all of eternity. That's what we have to look forward to. So why are we letting our feelings in this part affect our praise from the whole? We always have a reason to praise. We always have a reason to rejoice. We always have a reason. We gotta find the right in to find it, okay? So number one, number one, we find our yet. Number two, we find our in. And number three, find your out. What in the world, John? What are you talking about? Your worship, your praise will always be an expression, Right? Now, you might be thinking, well, you know, John, I'm, I'm reserved, I'm an introvert, and I worship in my heart, and that's good. And I think that that is completely valid, and I would 100% agree with you. You can worship God. Let me, let me kind of preface this by saying you can worship God by standing like this, but inwardly you are, your heart is bowed, reverent, worshiping. But I would also say to you as you look through Scripture, it's, you'd be hard-pressed to find Every person in the Bible, at some point in time, there was some sort of an expression. There was something that finally had to work itself out into an expression. You will find clapping of the hands in Scripture. You will find shouting. You will find dancing. Uh, you will find singing. You will find all different types of expressions. Because once you become filled to a certain point, and once you find your yet, and once you get your in, man, something's got to come out. So we gotta find our out. And I'm not here to tell you, you're not really worshiping unless you look, raise you know, both hands. And let me tell you the right out, okay? If you don't get on your knees for at least 30 seconds and then raise your hand, and you gotta move from carrying the boxes posture to, to totally, you guys know that one, right? I'm carrying the boxes. This is my worship, God, I'm carrying the boxes. And there's all these different, like how high did your hands go? I'm, not, I'm just, I'm saying for you, how is it expressing? How, how is this coming out of us. So, so praise and worship are, are really intentional. They're, they're things that we move beyond our feelings, beyond our circumstances, beyond 
uh, what we feel in the moment, and they become intentional actions that I believe when you engage these intentional actions, they activate an appropriate perspective. Um, it's something that I am very intentional about. If I begin to feel or sense darkness or worry or fear or anything that I would label as not from God, okay, let's, let's, let's what, what are those things? I would say shame, worry, doubt, fear, anxiety, all of these things that come to talk you into something or to feed into your mind. I think that one of the greatest things you can ever do is turn on some worship music and to begin to move past how you feel what you're doing is you're step, when, you, when you engage in worship, you are stepping out of the things of this world and you're taking a step into the courts of heaven. And all of a sudden, when you step into a heavenly being, when you step into a heavenly world, right, the kingdom of heaven, all of the things of this earth grow strangely dim. It's the difference between sitting on a tarmac in an airplane and looking out the window and flying at 30,000 feet and looking out the window. Your perspective changes. Worship is one of the greatest gifts that we have as believers, but the reason we don't ever engage in it is because we don't feel like it. We're waiting on a feeling to prompt us. Let me show you something um, that David engaged in. Uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 14, David is ushering back the, the Ark of the Covenant. Remember this story? In, in, in 2 Samuel 6, 14, and it says, then David came dancing before the Lord, watch these words, with abandon. Uh, this word abandon uh, means, it, if you look it up in the dictionary, it means to give up control, to give up with the intent of never again claiming a right or an interest in it. Um, this is where we get the, the kind of the phrase abandon ship. When you abandon ship, what you're saying is that ship, I'm emphasizing the p, because that would be bad, okay? That ship has nothing more to offer me. I'm getting off of it, and I'm never going back to it. I'm abandoning it. And what was happening in my life, when I began to engage in worship, I abandoned shame. I abandoned the thought of what everybody might be thinking about me while I worship. And I said, I'm never going back to that. I'm abandoning that. And what you're seeing in David, it says that he danced with full abandonment. And if you continue to read that, his wife was looking out the window and he comes up, you know, to, to, to take off, his, to, to take off his, his shoes and, you know, watch CNN. I don't know what he's doing. He's coming in to hang out and his wife's like, shame on you, shame on you. You are an embarrassment. She's like, you're the king. You're the king and you're dancing around like a fool. And, and David says one of the greatest things, one of the greatest comebacks ever. He says, I will become even more digni undignified than this. What's he saying? He's like, I've fully abandoned what anybody else thinks about me. I'm dancing for, for God. He's the only one I care about. He's the only one I'm obsessed with. I don't really care what anybody thinks because I have abandoned this. And despite my circumstances, think about David. David had been through everything. People threw spears at David. He was wrongly accused. He was, he was abused. His own, his own son tried to take over his kingdom. He had been through everything. What, what, what did he do? He found his yet. Yeah, well, I praise him. He found his end. I'm not worshiping God because he's fixing everything in my life. I'm worshiping God because he's a good God. And he's on the throne. And the result of finding your yet and finding your in is you will find your out. There will be some new expression that comes out of you. And, I, and listen, I don't care what it is. I, I'm not here to define that for you. You need to talk about that with the Lord. I, that's not for me to, to find out or to tell you what to do. But there's something that comes out of me. There's a new expression in Psalm 40, verse three. It says, he taught me. Think about those words. It's talking about God. God taught me how to sing the latest God song a praise song to our God. More and more people are seeing this. They enter the mystery, abandoning themselves to God. Abandoning themselves to God.
I, I really see my role in a lot of ways as, as I am a lead pastor, I am a preacher, and we have some of the most gifted worship leaders on the planet. Um, Pastor Oscar, Pastor Kevin, Pastor Marcy, uh, Stephen Jeffrey at the, at the Edmund campus, Marcy at the Edmund campus. I mean, if you've ever been to one of our worship nights, it's unbelievable. We have amazing talent, amazing instruments, amazing drummers, amazing everything. I actually see my role as the lead pastor. One of my biggest jobs is to be the worship leader. <laughs> my prayer is that when you look on the front row, you see us leading in worship. Uh, Second Chronicles chapter 20, there's this amazing story where uh, the enemy is coming against Jehoshaphat and, and, the, and the Israelites. And it's a vast army that's literally impossible to win. Jehoshaphat calls a, a fast. They pray, they fast. The Lord comes to Jehoshaphat, gives him a word. Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat gives the command of the Lord that has come. And the command is to go out and face them. Go out and face, worst case scenario. I mean, there's no way they can win this war. The, the Bible uh, describes the army as more numerous than, sand, than the sand on the seashore. I don't know if you've ever been to the shore, of the beach. Vast army, worst case scenario. And Jehoshaphat tells the people, okay, we're gonna go out and face them tomorrow. And he says, I want, I want to put the worshipers out in front. The worshipers are gonna lead us into battle with no weapons only the weapon of, their, of the warfare of their tongue. I don't know about you, but I, I don't know that I'd wanna lead that charge. The worship, worship is warfare. And it's something we aren't good at engaging in as believers. And it's because we're led by our feelings. We are a part of an uncommon kingdom that we can move beyond feelings, we can move beyond emotions, we can, we can even, I know it sounds crazy, we can actually move beyond worst case scenarios and still find a yet and find an in and find an out to express, to move beyond and simultaneously to believe that my worship, my ability, to rise above my circumstances and sing a joyful noise unto the Lord and worship when I don't have any reason to worship could actually be breaking chains off of me and breaking chains off my kids and my marriage and my workplace and my business and my church when I just move beyond my feelings. So I want us to walk, I want us to, to practice this. I like, I like, I love, I'm, on, I'm an education guy, so I like to, to hear knowledge, but then I like to experience it. Because then we have experiential learning, and experiential learning is the best kind of learning, all right? So I want you to stand to your feet with me. I want Edmund Campus to stand to your feet with me. Even if you're watching online at home in your living room, maybe you're with your spouse, as awkward as it may be, I encourage you to stand to your feet right in your living room and engage in this moment with us. So for some of you, this is this is... This is, a, this is a push, you know, this is like a nudge because maybe you grew up in a de denomination where this was actually frowned upon. Or may, maybe you just never really engaged in this, you're kind of new to church and you're like, man, I knew I should have went to a different church today because this is weird. I'm just gonna push you a little bit and nudge you outside of your comfort zone. Remember last week, I'm gonna turn your bottle just a quarter turn. Y'all remember that? I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna disrupt you just enough, okay, to get us outside of our comfort zone. So I'm not telling you what you need to do, but I'm gonna encourage you to find a new out this morning, find a new expression. I'm gonna lead you and guide you into us being worshipful. In a room of this size with Edmund and, and, and watching online, there are some worst case scenarios in this room right now. There are some really difficult seasons, really difficult challenges, really difficult things. And you were hoping that I was gonna bring a word that would solve all your problems. My question is, can you worship even if your problem doesn't get solved? Can we move beyond and believe that we still have a reason to praise Him? So let's just, let's just activate this. Come on, will you just, just take your hands and I want you to lift your hands somehow. I don't care if you hold the baby or the box. I don't care if you go full abandonment. I don't care if you do the one arm. I don't really care. Just engage in some capacity. Here's what I wanna challenge you with. Before we sing one note, before we sing one word, can you praise Him right where you stand? 
Just begin. Some of you are seasoned. You're like, yep, I got this. Here we go. Now let me coach some of you through the door. Like, I don't know what to do. You're just talking to God like he's standing right in front of your face. You're, you just begin to say, God, I love you. I worship you. I adore you. I adore you. The Bible says to enter into those courts with thanksgiving. So just say, God, thank you. Thank you that my life's not perfect, but here I am. I'm drawing breath. I'm alive. There is wind in my lungs to speak. Thank him. Worship him. God, we adore you. We thank you. We praise you. Come on, move past your feelings. Come on, move past your feelings. Open your mouth. God, we just begin to worship you. We begin to praise you outside of our comfort zone, beyond our feelings, beyond our ability, beyond the feelings that we have. We move past that into a worshipful attitude, a reverent attitude, Father. God, we thank you that you are still on your throne, that all of eternity is in your hand, that the world is your footstool, that my circumstances don't minimize you. You are bigger. You are stronger. Change our perspective this morning. Change our joining us here today for this week's message. And here at Victory Church, we are called to equip people to live in His presence, move beyond ourselves, and be transformed. And this can only happen through your radical generosity, your serving, and your prayers. If this message or any of our messages have impacted your life and you would like to partner with us by giving into this ministry, you can do so by visiting our website at victory.church/give. Thank you again for joining us and have a great day.